In January 2008, unbeknownst to the world, something shady was happening off the southern coast of Sri Lanka. Construction was beginning on a shiny new 4,000-acre port in the tiny town of Hambantota. 85% of the $361 million price tag was paid for with Chinese loans. But this, on its own, was no cause for concern. China's XM Bank funds thousands of projects around the world. What was strange was the location. Positioned between the Suez Canal and Strait of Malacca, tens of thousands of ships pass by each year on their way between Europe and Asia, one of the busiest transcontinental routes. Yet Sri Lanka, with a population of 21 million, already had a profitable functioning port just 100 miles northwest, in Colombo, the world's 25th busiest, in fact. So why, then, build a second so close in such a small town and at such great expense? Sure enough, this skepticism would soon be vindicated. In 2012, 3,667 ships berthed at the neighboring port of Colombo. Two years had passed then since the opening of Hambantota, yet it attracted just 34. By 2016, the project had lost $230 million according to its own Ministry of Finance. And there's more. In addition to the seaport, an equally pristine and equally empty airport was built nearby. The last remaining airline pulled out in 2018 due to insufficient demand. Its long runway and modern terminal may now be used for long-term parking. So, if not profit, what motivated these extravagant investments? It all begins to crystallize when you just zoom out. Sri Lanka is geographically blessed not only with proximity to global shipping lanes, it's also just 34 miles at its closest point to India, one of China's closest rivals. Coincidence? Maybe. But then, in 2017, came what many see as the smoking gun. Unable to pay back its many multi-million dollar loans, Sri Lanka was forced to hand over the port and 15,000 acres around it to China. It didn't take a wild imagination to see how the country then already notorious for making illegal claims in the South China Sea might use this strategic outpost for more than mere shipping. Since then, close observers have watched the same early warning signs play out around the globe. Tajikistan, Djibouti, Ethiopia, Kyrgyzstan, Angola, Nigeria. What could once be dismissed as circumstantial, many now argue has become a neo-colonial playbook. It's called the Debt Trap. Debt Trap Diplomacy. Debt Trap. Debt Trap Diplomacy. Here's what happens. First, China approaches a small, impoverished nation, usually in Africa, with an offer it can't refuse. Stadiums, palaces, roads, ports, it doesn't really matter what it is. Between 2000 and 2019, Chinese banks have loaned an estimated $153 billion to African governments alone. Looking at a map, it's hard to find a place on the continent that hasn't taken Chinese loans. Inevitably, the project fails. Trains sit empty, airports open without flights, roads lead to nowhere, and an oil refinery runs at just 6% capacity. In fact, it almost seems like China wants them to fail. Finally, the coup de grace. After the fanfare has subsided and the recipient country is left right back where it started, plus crumbling roads and mountains of debt, in swoops China. It generously offers to forgive the loans, and all it asks for is one thing in return. A tiny, insignificant piece of its sovereign territory. And voila, China has a new military base. Or rather, that's how the story goes. The debt trap narrative is so often repeated that it's been labeled a meme. Yet, almost everything said thus far is either downright wrong or at least misleading. In the case of Sri Lanka, no debt was ever forgiven, no sovereignty was ceded to China, there is no military base, and China didn't approach Sri Lanka, Sri Lanka approached China. 
There's another way to make sense of China's actions, and it neither requires that you assume it's evil nor benevolent. Sponsored by Brilliant. Learn math, science, and computer science the intuitive way with the link in the description. When poor countries need money, wealthy ones, through organizations like the Development Assistance Committee, have, for the last 80 years, provided it. But what these largely Western countries and banks will pay for has changed dramatically over time. At one point, 70% of World Bank financing went toward economic infrastructure physical things like roads, water, and electricity. Today, just 30% in favor of things like education, democratic elections, and family planning. But while the West has largely moved on from infrastructure, the developing world hasn't. Africa, for instance, receives only about half of the $130 to $170 billion in infrastructure it needs each year leaving it with a massive $68 to $108 billion gap. Now, hold that thought for a second. Sometime around 2010, the world's most populous country had a problem. After two decades of breakneck growth and development, it began, to put it simply, running out of things to build. China was still developing like crazy, but with diminishing returns. By 2012, the profit rate of new domestic infrastructure projects fell below zero. Meanwhile, the entire economy, and with it the party's legitimacy, depends on these construction jobs, excess foreign exchange, and the manufacturing industry. In short, to feed the bottomless appetite of capitalism, China needed to find new consumers. Supply, meet, demand. In Africa, it found the perfect match. If one views development as a predictable, repeatable series of stages, China was only recently one stage ahead of Africa, meaning it had lots of experience building exactly the sorts of things it now needed. Whether true or not, China believed its port cities and economic zones were models that could be exported across the globe. It was the perfect collision of excess supply and unmet demand. In just a few short years, Chinese overseas investment exploded. For recipient nations, this wasn't just a lot of money at the right time, but also the right kind. When giant multilateral institutions like the World Bank lend you money, you better be prepared to show exactly how, when, who, and where it went. And in addition to all the paperwork you'll have to fill out and kickbacks you'll miss out on, you might even be required to implement policy reforms. Aid, in other words, is both free and extremely costly. That is, until China came along. The icing on the cake of Chinese money is that its companies don't ask why do you need this project, only when can we get started. The result is that these investments are designed to be as scrupulous and economically viable as are the recipient governments. When local politicians are careful and institutions strong, Chinese investment is uniquely valuable because it takes on countries and projects someone more cautious might avoid. The Chinese shipping conglomerate Costco, for instance, turned Greece's purest port into the Mediterranean's second largest, despite being one of only two bidders to take control in 2016. Low-interest Chinese loans helped Angola boost its credit rating, giving it access to new lenders. When it goes poorly, on the other hand, it can go really poorly. The state-owned Chinese communications construction company was debarred from the World Bank for bribery, and Chinese officials were involved in Malaysia's development Burhad scandal. In the case of Sri Lanka's Hambantota port, the story is a bit more complex. First, you may ask, was the project destined to fail? The answer is inconclusive. What we do know is that its government had been considering the project for decades before it approached China. And while the port of Colombo is indeed nearby, it was then approaching capacity, and many of the world's ports are close to one another. A second and separate question is, was corruption involved? Here, the answer is a resounding yes. Hambantota is not just any rural coastal town, but the hometown of the president who signed off on the project. 
Despite a large rock blocking the harbor, making it entirely unusable, it opened on his birthday in 2010, a sign of his personal association and involvement. $7.6 million of project funds were secretly diverted to his failed re-election campaign. If there is a pattern to China's overseas investments, it might be frequent, though not universal, corruption. Bribes and kickbacks are widespread across much of the developing world, and Chinese companies seem generally willing to pay them. A significant number of these projects benefit no one except local politicians and Chinese developers. But corruption is not the same as a deliberate debt trap. If China wanted its borrowers to default on their loans, one might expect it to specifically target countries likely to do so. Yet, independent researcher after researcher has failed to find any such evidence. Quote, It is unlikely that the Belt and Road Initiative will be plagued with widespread debt sustainability problems, says the Center for Global Development. The Lowy Institute finds that, quote, 90% of China's bilateral loans have gone to countries that could sustainably absorb such debt. And finally, Deborah Brodigam of Johns Hopkins writes, quote, So far in Africa, we have not seen any examples where we would say the Chinese deliberately entangled another country in debt. Experts attribute China's slightly higher lending to high-risk countries as compared to, say, Japan or the World Bank, to its sheer scale. Remember, we're talking about over 10,000 projects across over 100 countries. With this much money being spread across this wide a surface area, there will be a few white elephants. Add in its no-strings-attached, look-the-other-way approach, and that number doubles. Now, China may not set out with this intention, but you might argue that once it sees an opportunity, it takes advantage. Two countries are usually cited as examples. First, if all one knows about Sri Lanka is that it took out a $300 million loan in 2008 from China, who then took over that same port in 2017, it may appear to be a clear-cut case of debt trap diplomacy. But what this version of events misses is context. At the time the deal was struck, China was not even Sri Lanka's largest source of debt. Actually, it owed more to the Asian Development Bank, Japan, and the World Bank. The Chinese portion represented just 10% of the total. So why did Sri Lanka make the deal? In 2004, it suffered a devastating tsunami, which contributed to a decline in exports. This, in turn, led to a balance of trade problem. In short, because it was importing more than it was exporting, it ran out of US dollars, which it needed to make payments on its loans. In other words, Sri Lanka needed hard cash today, which China provided. It was almost certainly unwise to take out even more loans to build the Hambantota port, at least at that time. But it would have had this problem regardless, because the vast majority of its debt was owed to other nations and institutions. The exact details of the deal are also frequently misconstrued. What actually happened is that the Chinese company paid $1.1 billion for a 70% stake of a 99-year lease. No debt was forgiven in the process. The money was used to pay off other loans from other countries. Neither will it gain a new military base, at least not, as the lease stipulates, without Sri Lanka's explicit permission. Next is Djibouti. Here, in 2015, China built its first and currently only overseas military base. But so has Germany, and Spain, and France, the UK, Saudi Arabia, and the US. Its colonial history is long and complicated, but the ultra-condensed version is that, in place of natural resources, Djibouti has access. Access to this 18-mile wide choke point between the Red Sea and Indian Ocean. Its leaders have squeezed this fact for all it's worth by renting land to almost any military willing to pay. Even Russia is invited. Africa is not a country. Every nation that borrows from China is different. The debt trap narrative is right to identify an inherent power differential between giant China and the mostly much smaller countries it lends to. But by portraying China as the only party with agency, it neglects the unique circumstances of each nation, 
and absolves corrupt local politicians of all culpability. Take a look, for instance, at the amount of debt China has refinanced, renegotiated, or outright forgiven. Less than France or Japan, but not far behind the US or Germany. This data suggests recipients have some degree of leverage. Of course, none of this should be confused with charity. When Chairman Xi Jinping visits Senegal, one of the continent's poorest nations, for example, China gains something valuable though intangible. While it may not be a primary motivation, it receives in return diplomatic recognition, support, and when it comes to, say, the South China Sea or Xinjiang, silence. So, is Chinese investment A, an ambitious 21st century Marshall Plan on steroids, or B, one giant Trojan horse designed to bankrupt poor countries and put the People's Liberation Army in every corner of the globe? Well, neither. It's not much of a plan at all. You may have noticed this video makes no reference to its official name, the Belt and Road Initiative. That's because it doesn't really exist. Originally called the Silk Road Economic Belt with Central Asian Countries in 2013, the project has become increasingly vague and amorphous since. To this day, there is no clear definition of what is and isn't a Belt and Road project. In fact, different levels of its own government disagree. Look at a map of all participating countries, and it becomes so large as to lose all meaning. There is no grand, cohesive 50-year strategy. And that's the problem. The same inefficient construction and opaque backroom deals that characterize the Chinese domestic economy are now being replicated abroad. That should raise eyebrows. The danger of criticizing China for the wrong reasons is that it reduces credibility when you need it the most. That's the importance of logical consistency, a skill that today's sponsor, Brilliant, teaches you in this brand new, fun, interactive course. What I like about Brilliant is that it makes learning fun by focusing on applying knowledge through interactive puzzles, riddles, and games, not just rote memorizing facts. They have courses on everything from programming to quantum computing, physics, and calculus. Click the link on screen now and the first 200 people will get 20% off their annual premium subscription. You can even gift a subscription to a friend or family member. Go pick what interests you most and start learning today.